welcome, Philip. Yes, thank you, Alexander, and thank you for the invitation. I mean, actually, I've been a regular visitor to Monash for the last 20 years, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about the explosive universe. Now, <coughs> if you look at the night sky, well, you might see something like this. Well, this is through a telescope, but in Australia, in the desert, you know what this is. This is a picture of the Milky Way. And in fact, this is a picture of the center of the Milky Way. The point is, if you look at the sky, everything looks quite static and peaceful. Now, you know there are meteorites, little pebbles of dust falling in the atmosphere and, blow and burning up. And occasionally, every 100 million years ago, 100 million years or so, there's a comet killing all the dinosaurs. But otherwise, you think of the universe as something rather peaceful. Now, this is really misleading, because you can't really see in images like, optical images like this, where all the action is. It's illustrated in this collage by NASA, which shows the same picture, the Milky Way, in many different wave bands. And you can see it looks very different in different bands. Just, just picked out three bands. Top one again is this optical image where you see not you can't see much because of all the dust. If you go to the infrared, then you can see through the dust, and then you see all the stars. When you go to a line of molecular hydrogen, it looks completely different. Now you don't see stars, now you see the gap in the Milky Way. And you see there's actually a lot of motion. There's gas splashing around everywhere. And the whole galaxy is quite a dynamical thing. Stars form all the time, or evolve and die, and create these flows. Now, this is not what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about this, <coughs> a supernova. Supernova, and the word nova means a new star, and supernova means a bright new star that all of a sudden appears in the sky. This is a before and after image of supernova 1987A, which is a particularly important one because it was the last supernova one could see with the naked eye. It occurred on the 23rd of February of 1987. I, at the time, was working on my PhD at MIT. And when this happened, it completely changed my PhD thesis, and I then wrote a thesis about this. <coughs> This is a very important supernova, not only because it was a naked eye supernova, it also, you could also actually see the star that exploded. This big arrow points at the star in the pre-supernova image before it exploded. This star had been catalogued, and it didn't look like any particularly unusual star. It didn't look like a star that was close to explode. It looked like a middle-aged, massive star. In fact, the name Nova, new star, is completely misleading because this is not associated with the formation of a star, it's the death of the star. Now, this occurred in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which you can only see from the southern hemisphere. I have never seen it, even though I wrote a thesis about it. Who has seen it with their naked eye? Probably quite a few. Yes. <coughs> you have an advantage over me here. Anyway, I'll come back to this later. This is one type of supernova that is associated with a massive star. Now, in our galaxy, a supernova occurs roughly every 100 years. But there are, of course, many galaxies. There are about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And so somewhere in the universe, a supernova occurs every few seconds. So you only have to look carefully, and you will find a supernova. This is another one. <coughs> Here you see this bright new star in this galaxy called the Cigar Galaxy. This is a, another important supernova. It's a different type. It's one that actually occurred earlier this year. And I will explain the difference later on. <coughs> this image shows another type of supernova explosion. There's this image. Where you see the smudge. This is a blown-up version of it. And here you see this optical object which is associated with the gamma reverse, the optical afterglow of the gamma reverse, and this 
this was one of the big puzzles of the later part of the 20th century, which we have now largely resolved. So my talk, I will start with first making a few remarks about the universe, telling you about the basics of how stars evolved before then discuss these various types of supernovae. At the end, I will also tell you why supernovae are actually important for us. Now, the biggest explosion in the universe, of course, is the universe itself. We all know that the universe started from a Big Bang, and this is a very nice illustration that sort of gives you a schematic outline of the cosmic history. It starts with the Big Bang here, about 13.7 billion years ago. Everything was very hot, and everything expanded from a point, but it cooled very rapidly, and soon it became actually very dark. This period started a few thousand years, 100,000 years after the Big Bang, is called the Dark Age. At some point, stars and galaxies started to form, and they lit up the universe again. And at some point, everything was reionized, and then the universe started to look more like it looks today. One the transition from this dark epoch to the present bright epoch again is, is actually one of the major areas of research, and supernovae and gamma bursts can actually probe this transition phase. I will show you this later. You can actually also use supernovae not only to measure the expansion of the universe, but also to show that the universe is accelerating. I think you all have heard about this. The universe is accelerating, and you know, to accelerate the universe, you need some energy source, and many people consider the question of what is that energy source, that dark energy source, one of the main questions of modern physics. I will come back to that just later as well. Now, <coughs> how do supernovae fit into life cycle of stars. This is illustrated here. Stars form out of gas, molecular clouds. Then they evolve and at some point die and eject a lot of the, the mass that was inside the stars into the interstellar medium. That's then mixed with the, red, the gas in the galaxy and then you form new stars. And this cycle goes on and on and you enrich the gas in universe by successive cycles of supernovae. This here <coughs> is a famous picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Pillars of Creation. And what you see here, well not directly, is but indirectly, is the formation of stars. See a couple of bright stars here. These are all massive young stars that just formed and they now illuminate this, these trunk, elephant trunk-like features with their blue light, blue-green light. This is molecular gas, and it's very dusty, and so you can't really see through it. And this is actually where the real star formation occurs. Somewhere, I don't know exactly where, hidden beneath these dusty molecular clouds, there's very active star formation going on right now. To see this, you have to go actually to the infrared. In fact, this is shown here. This is an optical image, that's an infrared image of a particular region of Orion. Now you see here there are four stars. So the same four stars here, trapezium stars. And behind that you see again this dusty molecular cloud. And the optical, you only see these four stars, but in the infrared you can look through the dust and you see there's this cluster of stars that's forming just behind these four massive stars in foreground. Indeed, it seems that most stars form in a very clustered type environment, as you see in this cluster of Orion. And these clusters, of course, don't survive. They disperse later, and then we get stars in a much more isolated fashion, as we see today. With the Hubble Space Telescope, you can also look at individual stars. 
And this, again, is a collection of individual stars that are still in the process of formation. And you often see these features around it. You see this, this disk-like feature here. In fact, this is a disk, seen edge on. Or here you see it from the top. This is dusty gas that surrounds this young star at the center. And because the dust doesn't let the light from the background through, it looks like a dark silhouette. You often, you always see, you very often see these features, and they have a typical size of a few hundred AUs. AU stands for astronomical unit. One astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the Earth, which is about 200 times the radius of the sun. Now, this, these disks, which are so ubiquitous, are exactly the size of our own solar system. Indeed, this is, these are the protoplanet disks in which we think planets like our own form in the future. And in some of these cases, they may already be formed. Now, just a simple picture for star formation is shown, illustrated in this cartoon. It's stars like the sun form out of molecular, out of a molecular cloud that's typically a million times bigger than the sun is today. But rather than collapsing directly to form a star at the center, there's always a little bit of rotation in a big cloud like that. It first has to collapse into a disk. In fact, you can estimate the size of the disk just using a momentum conservation. You find that the typical size of these disks is exactly a few hundred AUs. The typical size of the disk. So, the expectation has been for many, many years, many decades, that whenever you form a star, you also form a disk. And this, of course, uh, led us to believe that planets should be very common. And of course, you've probably heard talks about planets. In the last 20 years, this has become a big industry. We now know that planets are ubiquitous. And this is exactly what people predicted already in the 60s. OK, once you have a star, well, the closest star you know is the sun. What is a star? Well, a star, like the sun, consists mainly of hydrogen and helium. It's a plasma. It's a fully ionized gas. And it's kept together by its own gravity. It's a self-gravitating object. Of course, gravity is attractive. So in order to stop it from collapsing, you need some counter force. And in the case of the sun, this is force, pressure forces. The inside of the sun is hot. That provides a pressure that balances the gravitational attraction. Now, this balance of gravity and pressure forces is called hydrostatic activity. <clears throat> On the other hand, you know the star radiates. So it loses energy all the time. So in principle, if there were no energy source, the sun would cool down. And the time scale for the sun to lose all of its thermal energy would be about 10 million years. Now this was a big problem 150 years ago or so, because it was then realized that the Earth, at least, was at least a billion years old. And so there was a big question for many, many years, what would actually keep the sun hot to provide the pressure <coughs> to stop it collapsing? You all know this problem was solved in the 30s when nuclear fusion, nuclear physics was invented. And the energy source at the center of the sun is the fusion of hydrogen to helium, essentially four protons fusing to one for hydrogen. Now, this are, these are the same reactions which we would like to provide the energy source in fusion reactors in the future. Now, the sun has solved the problem of confinement. It's the gravity that keeps the plasma confined. Now, how does this generate energy? Well, you all know Einstein showed that energy and mass are equivalent. The mass of the helium nucleus is 
slightly less than the mass of four protons. And the difference in mass times C squared is the energy released in the reaction. In the case of hydrogen fusion, we can translate this into a fraction of energy that's, that's released in energy. In fact, it's 0.7% of the ma rest mass energy of hydrogen that's converted to energy. Now, the sun is doing this at the moment. At some point in the future, the helium will also fuse. And then we have actually what happens six seconds here. You have three helium nuclei fusing to produce carbon-12. And if you add another helium nucleus, you get, get oxygen-16. But this reaction occurs at a much higher temperature than hydrogen. It ends up the sun has a temperature of about 50 million Kelvin. This occurs at a temperature of 100 to 200,000 Kelvin. Moreover, the energy that's released in helium fusion will be much less than 0.1% efficiency of nuclear fusion of hydrogen. Now, the sun at the moment is 4.6 billion years old. It has roughly used half of its nuclear, half of its hydrogen in the center. So it has another 4 or 5 billion years to live. Now, it can't immediately start to ignite helium because that requires a much higher temperature. So what happens after the sun has used up all of its hydrogen, it will start to contract. And that releases gravitational energy. Just the same way if you drop a tennis ball and it will accelerate, you convert gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. And in this case, you convert it to thermal energy. This provides part of the energy that is lost at the surface, but it also heats up the core. And when the temperature reaches 28 Kelvin, then the helium can start to fuse. The evolution of stars in general is, in fact, governed by the alternation of nuclear burning phases and contraction phases. Now, while this happens in the center of the sun, the sun becomes denser and hotter, something strange happens the envelope actually starts to expand. As shown here, in fact, the star, the sun will become what is called a red giant. At the end of the sun's life, the radius of the sun will be about a factor of 200 bigger than it is now. Now, I told you that it already that the distance from the sun to us is also about 200 solar radius. So, rather than looking like this, at some point, the sun will fill the whole sky. And it will not be yellow anymore. It will be become red. In fact, it's a close call. The sun may, in fact, engulf the, the Earth and destroy it. Now, it won't affect us much because we will all, mankind will long be gone because it will have become far too hot for life on Earth anyway. Now, for the sun, this is about it. After helium burning, we have now mainly carbon and oxygen in the core. The sun will eject its envelope to form what is a planetary nebula. And the core of the sun will stay, remain at the center. The sun, at this point, will become, have become what's called a white dwarf. It's a very compact object is composed of carbon and oxygen and has the typical size of the Earth. So you have to think of the Sun in its present mass compressed to the size of the Earth. White dwarfs are stable objects <coughs> because in these the, the pressure support is actually electron degeneracy. So this is a quantum effect. An electron gas, even at zero temperature, has a finite energy, which means it has a finite pressure and that can maintain the pressure balance with the gravity at that infinitum. However, there's a maximum mass for which this can happen. The maximum mass of a white dwarf where electron degeneracy is important, and that's called the Chandrasekhar mass, that will become important later. And that maximum
maximum mass is about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So this, <coughs> again, solution of the sun at the top shows you what I just explained. Form the star, the star becomes a circular giant. More massive stars also become red giant, but in addition to that, they can continue burning elements, heavier elements. So more massive stars, and I'm now talking about stars more massive than 10 times the mass of the sun, continue this alternation of nuclear burning in contraction phases. So after we have a carbon oxygen core, we have contraction until the temperature is high enough that carbon can fuse to elements like neon, sodium, and magnesium. After that, the core contracts further till the oxygen can burn, and get elements like silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and also some other magnesium. And after oxygen burning, things become more complicated. There are lots of reactions, so-called summarized under the term silicon burning, but hundreds of reactions. But the main outcome of this is that you ultimately form an iron core. Now iron is very special because iron is the most tightly bound nucleus and with iron you can no longer gain any further energy by fusing it or fissioning it. So there's no longer any energy source. So at the center of a massive star you will have iron and then surrounding it you may have incomplete shells of incomplete burning, like silicon, oxygen, and so on. But the iron core can no longer produce any energy. And if the iron core is bigger, then the Chandrasekhar mass, the maximum mass at which electron degeneracy is important, there's nothing that can stop it from contracting and ultimately Now, once this happens, something funny happens. This, and under these conditions, the temperatures are very high, and photons can start to dis photon disintegrate the ion nuclei. First, to elements like helium, and later the helium can be also disintegrated, and you basically just form protons and neutrons. So as things contract and collapse, you undo all of the reactions you did in the previous burning phases and just have, in the end, have protons and neutrons. At some point, the protons and neutrons start essentially to touch each other, you reach nuclear densities, and then the strong force becomes important and becomes repulsive and stops the collapse. At this point, we have an object just composed of protons and neutrons, many neutrons, in fact, and this is what's called a neutron star. Now, <coughs> a neutron star is very dense, has a mass that's more than the mass of the sun, but it has a typical radius of about 10 kilometers. So it's actually smaller than a meson. So it's even much smaller than the white dwarfs I talked about before. Now, you may find this strange. How is it possible that you undo all of the nuclear reactions star built up over many millions of years. Well, in this contraction, you release a lot of gravitational energy. And in fact, you release roughly 10% of the rest mass energy of this collapsing material. This is much more than the energy that you needed to build up, that, that was generated when you built up the iron in the first place. So there's plenty of energy. And this final phase, which only lasts a few seconds, you therefore generate much more energy than the star has generated throughout its whole lifetime. The total amount of energy you get is given by this number, 3 times 10 to the 46 joule. So that's a big number. It doesn't mean much, but it's what it is. <coughs> it's a big number. And it's much more energy than what you need to actually explode the rest of the star, because the supernova not the collapse of the core, but it's the ejection, the explosion of most of the envelope. 
But there's a problem. And the problem is that this energy doesn't come out in the form of photons or thermal energy. It comes out in the form of neutrinos. Now, neutrinos are very weakly interacting particles. I mean, the sun I mean, produces lots of neutrinos every second. There are about a million billion neutrinos passing through each of you without any, any effect. So most of these neutrinos just freely escape. And, but sometimes, occasionally, they interact with matter. And it's still an unsolved problem for these explosions how you can actually deposit perhaps 1% of that energy in the envelope to stop this collapse and reverse it to produce an explosion and a supernova. That is still an unsolved problem, but I know people here at Monash, in fact, are, are working on this at the moment. So the end product for, for a massive star is that you get a supernova, you form a neutron star, or more, even more massive stars, you actually may form a black hole. So this is the fate of a massive star. Now, there's a different type of explosion that occurs not in a massive star, but in a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. When it, when I told you, carbon-oxygen white dwarfs are supported by lactone degeneracy, and there's a maximum mass of about 1.4 the mass of the sun. Now, if a white dwarf gets close to this mass, it starts to ignite the carbon in the center. But in this case, carbon burning is explosive. You raise the temperature, and that raises the carbon burning, and that produces a thermonuclear runaway. It's exactly the same thing that happens in a nuclear bomb, except that rather than a fusion bomb, it's hydrogen burning, here it's carbon burning. In fact, it's no coincidence that many people who have worked on these supernova explosions have worked at Los Alamos and have, in fact, also often worked on, on other explosions. In any case, the main outcome of this is that you burn a large fraction of the star and you completely destroy it. But unlike the previous case, core collapse case, the energy is not gravitational energy, it's nuclear energy. It's about the same amount. <coughs> Because you completely burn the star, you don't expect any damage. In fact, one of the main elements you produce in this nuclear runaway is iron, and these are believed to be the dominant producer of iron in the universe. <coughs> now, these are the explosions that have been used to provide evidence for the accelerating universe. Now, one of the big problems in astronomy is how do you measure distances? And you see everything projected on the sky, but if you see a brighter star next to another one, you don't know whether that star is really brighter or whether it's just closer. And measuring distances has been really one of the big problems in astronomy for forever. Now, one way to determine the distance to an object is by using the concept of a standard candle. And that's very simple. I mean, if you have a light bulb, say you have a 100 watt light bulb, well, at a certain distance, you can measure the energy per unit area, the flux. If you increase the distance, that flux will decrease. And it's just simple geometry, it decreases like one of the distance squared. So if you measure the flux and you know the power of your light bulb, you can calculate the distance. Very simple. And so, in order to use that concept in astronomy, you need to know the, the intrinsic luminosity of an object. And in the early 90s, people like Sol Perlmutter thought one could use type 1a supernovae, these thermonuclear explosions, because they all occur, seem to occur, when they reach the Chandrasekhar. Now, it turns out that type 1, these supernovae are not actually good standards. This is shown here. 
these are light curves, so-called light curves. And this is a function of time. So this is in days. This scale is a is the power, it's a logarithmic scale of power. So something that's further up is more powerful. And you see there's actually quite a diversity in these light curves. Some of them much brighter than others. Now <coughs> So this is actually far too large to use them as reliable distance counters. However, Mark Phillips from uh, South America noticed, you can see that, look, the brighter supernovae, they decay more slowly than the fainter ones. And he noticed that there seemed to be one-to-one -one correlation between how rapidly they decay and how bright they are. Now, the decay time, the width of the light curve, is something you can measure independent of distance. So if you measure the width of the light curve, you can deduce what the peak luminosity is. Or you can do something more sophisticated. You can do some mapping of these light curves and stretch them in a certain way to map them all onto the same template. This is done here in this paper that was mapping done. You can see all of these light curves all seem to fall exactly onto this template. And this template you can use like a standard candle. So it's a well defined peak luminosity, peak magnitude. Now, when they did this in the late 90s, they realized that the more distant supernovae were fainter than you expected from the standard expansion. And that meant that there must be, have been an acceleration of the expansion of the universe since the light from these, from these supernovae was emitted. And this was the first evidence, or as already mentioned, that there must be some unknown source of energy, now referred to as the dark energy, that driving this, uh, this acceleration. And the Nobel Prize for this was given in 2011 to Schmidt, Ries, and Perlmutter. Brian Schmidt, I think he has given a talk here a few years ago on this. He's, I think, believe <coughs> the second Australian Nobel laureate. And that was the statement of the year. So. Now, however, they were really lucky. <coughs> because if this correction hadn't been found, this could not have been done. Some people even have said that perhaps Mark Phillips, who found out about this, should also have been rewarded the Nobel Prize because it wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Now, <coughs> despite the fact that we sort of understand what's happening here, we actually don't know what causes them. I told you here, in, this happens when the white dwarf gets close to the Chandrasekhar mass. But what makes the white dwarf grow in mass? And you need something. And this is a very controversial topic. Uh, this, these two cartoons illustrate the two main scenarios. One idea on the left is that you have a white dwarf in a binary system. And when the companion star gets close enough, mass is drawn, pulled from that companion star, and then it's secreted by the white dwarf, making it grow in mass. When it gets close to the Chandrasekhar mass, The other main idea is that rather than having one white dwarf, you have two. Two white CO white dwarfs. And if they're close enough, gravitational radiation will actually bring them together and make them merge at some point. And again, if the combined mass is above the Chandrasekhar mass, you might expect an explosion. <coughs> at the moment, we don't know which of these scenarios is the right one if any, or both. It's quite possible that I mean, there's evidence that there's maybe more than one channel, actually. OK, now let me return to supernova 1987A. I already said this occurred in a large magnetic cloud, and it was the first naked eye supernova since 
since 1604, and that last supernova was observed by Kepler. This was a before and after image, shows it early on. This is sort of a bigger image that shows the neighborhood of the supernova. You see this nebula, the tarantula nebula, which is an active region of star formation where many massive stars are forming now. And of course, it's no surprise that the supernova was the outer part of this star formation. One of the spectacular discoveries at the time was that neutrinos that you get from the collapse were observed. So the two neutrino detectors, and this sort of shows the time sequence of the neutrino detections. In total, there was a total number of neutrinos was 17 so hard to detect them. I mean, uh, and even though this is a times very small number, it was enough to deduce the amount of energy that must have been in this neutrino flux. And by modeling this, you could not only show that this signal is consistent with the formation of a neutron star, but also that the energy is was about three times that of the 46 joules. This is the large number I mentioned earlier, which was the expectation of the energy that should be released when a core, massive core collapses. Now, so this was, this with beyond, without any doubt, beyond any reason of a doubt, confirmed that this supernova, at least initially, produced a neutron star. I should say, of course, that um, 27 years later, we still haven't seen that neutron star. <coughs> In fact, some people have argued that perhaps later on this object collapsed to form a black hole. But that's still not possible. Now, so that was the success story, the successful part. But otherwise, the, the supernova is very different from expectations. I already mentioned to you the star that actually exploded was not the type of star you expected to explode. It was a blue supergiant rather than a red supergiant. There were also some chemical anomalies which I'll discuss, but one of the other very spectacular things about it is this image, it's again a Hubble picture of you know, the, the triple ring nebula surrounding the supernova. You see these three overlapping rings the supernova in this picture is only this blob in the center. All of this material is material that was ejected not by the supernova, but by the progenitor of the supernova roughly 20,000 years ago. This is a two-dimensional projection. Can you think about what this looks like in three dimensions? Astronomers are very bad in reconstructing three dimensions. But engineers, I'm sure, are much better. I'll show you. <coughs> this is a simple geometrical model. And it shows, in cross section, shows projection of the three rings. The central ring is this, the supernova is right in the center. this ring and that's the supernova. These other rings are these that are displaced from the central ring plane above and below. They're not quite um, parallel, but more or less parallel. If you observe these from this direction, you see overlap of the three, three rings as they look like almost axisymmetric, but it's not perfectly axisymmetric, but it's more or less axisymmetric. Now, the big question now is why would a star that's about to explode in 20,000 years would eject material in this funny way? <clears throat> usually when you have axisymmetric structures, that's usually some signature of rotation that uh, 
the rapid rotation. Now, I will tell you what I think the answer is. <clears throat> In fact, this is something I've worked on for the last 10, 10 years. That initially, you didn't just have one star, but two stars. In fact, most massive stars are not single, are not isolated stars. They typically have a companion star, and the companion star is often so close that the two stars interact. One of the most dramatic types of interactions is illustrated in this cartoon picture when, about 20,000 years ago, the star became a big red supergiant and it started to transfer mass to the companion star. In fact, engulfed the companion star and the two stars merged as a consequence. Now, when the two stars merge, ultimately form a single star, you release a lot of energy. Some of that energy ejects part of the envelope, which then pro provides the, the core of the, the nebula you see around it. Now, in our theory, after the merger has been completed, the structure of the star has changed significantly and now becomes a blue star, blue supergiant, because that's what it was at the time of the supergiant, you have a, also wind, a wind from this, and that will sweep up any of the structures that have been ejected earlier on. Now this is just a simple cartoon. Now we have calculated all of these phases in detailed high dynamic simulations. Thomas Morris did that in his PhD thesis. And I'll just show you the final outcome of this. This is the final structure going through all of these different phases and simulating it using high dynamic simulations. And this is showing the whole structures, but if you now look at the, the right inclination and take into account the contrast, you will see this. That's directly from this. And that, to a degree, looks very similar to what's actually observed. <coughs> so, so we have argued that this triple ring nebula provides really the fingerprint for the fact that there were actually two stars which merged 20,000 years ago. In fact, these spine detections generally are quite important, and a lot of the diversity of supernovae can be understood by different types of spine interactions. Now these are sort of the classical types of explosions, but for the last 15 years or so, it has become clear that there are other types of explosions. <coughs> there is now evident clear a new supernova class, which is much more energetic than the supernovae I've talked about so far. Typically, the supernovae I've talked about so far have this energy of 10 to 44 joules, and some of them are much more energetic, five or 50 times as energetic. The first one that was found of this type was this supernova. It's called Supernova 98W. What you see here again is logarithm of power, function of time. These are some typical supernovae. And this particular one is clearly much more luminous. Not, it's not only more luminous. It's also much more energetic. Now, these are not as common. They are quite rare. Only one in a thousand massive stars or so will do this. Over the last couple of years, or five years, another supernova class has been discovered that's even more luminous. They are now called superluminous supernovae. On this diagram, there would be somewhere up here. Now, at the moment, we know very little, very little direct evidence what, what these are, and I will not discuss these superluminous ones. Now, these are very interesting because they also are associated with the gamma ray bursts I mentioned at the beginning. Quite a few of these very luminous supernovae 
will also de have always have always also been detected as gamma reverse. Now, what are gamma reverse? Well, gamma reverse are flashes of gamma rays lasting from a fraction of a second to tens or hundreds of seconds. This sort of shows a random selection of these gamma reverse. This again is a power. You can't read the scale, the time axis, but the scale here is seconds. Here it's tens of seconds. Here it's hundreds of seconds. So they vary quite a bit. That the shortest one can be, in fact, as short as milliseconds, and the longest can be up to thousands. Now, they have a very interesting history because they were actually discovered by U.S. spy satellites. In the late 60s, the, the Americans had spy satellites, satellites that were looking for gamma ray emission from nuclear explosions they suspected the Russians might, Russians might do in the outer atmosphere. Gamma rays can't penetrate the atmosphere, so you have to observe it from satellites. But rather than finding gamma rays from nuclear explosions in the atmosphere, they found gamma rays from all over the sky. And these have remained one of the biggest mysteries in astronomy until the late 90s. At some point, there were actually many more gamma bursts. There were many more theories to explain the gamma bursts than gamma bursts. Now, in the 80s, people thought that these might be associated with neutron stars in our galaxy, like having an asteroid falling onto a neutron star. If that were the case, you would expect them to come from our galaxy, from the galactic disk, in fact. Now, in the early 19s, in the early 90s, another satellite was launched that was systematically exploring gamma ray bursts. And it found, that's the instrument found 2,700 gamma ray bursts. And this shows the location in the projection of the star. Now, this is in galactic coordinates, which means that the, the Milky Way, the galactic disk, should be along the equator. The center of the Milky Way is here. So if gamma ray bursts really were to come from from neutron stars in our galaxy, you would have expected them to be strongly concentrated towards the equator at the center. And I don't think you need any very sophisticated mathematics to realize that this distribution is pretty much isotropic. Now that was the situation in the early 90s. Now that still doesn't tell you really where they come from, because you can think of many different isotropic distributions. Now, even in the solar system, the comet cloud, the Oort cloud of comets, which is outside, just outside our solar system, is believed to be more or less spherical. And some people argue that these have something to do with colliding comets. I don't quite know why that gives you gamma rays, but certainly there were theories like that. The galaxy itself is surrounded by a big halo. And if these gamma bursts specifically occur in the halo, that could also give you an isotropic distribution. And then, of course, on the larger scale, the universe is more than isotropic. So depending, again, it's a question of distance scale. Depending what the distance is, these would be maybe common but low energy events to very energetic events. Now, the resolution of this puzzle was, came in the late 90s, when these were not only seen in gamma rays. Now, one of the big problems, I forgot to mention, is this satellite could not really pinpoint the location of these gamma rays very well. And within the error circles of any of these locations, you would have thousands of stars or galaxies, so you couldn't really look at individual objects. In the late 90s, it was, became possible to observe them also in x-rays and ultimately in the optical. And the optical, you can pinpoint the location much more precisely. 
and you were then able to look at spectra. And these spectra revealed absorption lines from intervening galaxies. And this is illustrated here. You have a camera burst that has some spectrum, energy as a function of wavelength. If there's a galaxy between the observer on the left and the camera burst, the galaxy absor uh, absorbs some of the light and produces an absorption line. Because the universe is expanding, galaxies, more distant galaxies move away more rapidly from the observer than a more distant more cl than a closer one. And by measuring the redshift of these absorption lines, we can basically reduce the distance of the intervening galaxies. In any case, the detection of these lines confirmed that there must be a galaxy between you and a gamma reverse, and therefore the only sort of possibility is that these gamma reverse were indeed cosmological. They really had to occur at cosmological distances. And this makes these events to some, some, some of the most energetic events in the universe. Now, there are different types of camera bursts. The only one I will mention here for now are the ones that have long durations last typically a few seconds, tens of seconds, hundreds of seconds. Now, we don't really know what, the, what they are, but this is the most popular model. And the idea is that they are also connected with the evolution of massive stars, but massive stars where the cores are rapidly rotating. So rather than collapsing, having core collapse in the center, as I said earlier, these collapse first into this, very similar to the protostar picture I showed you. And in this case, you get accretion of the central object from this disk, and whenever you have accretion from a disk, you often get jets. In this case, the idea is some of the energy is converted and produces relativistic jets. And you see gamma rays coming from these jets. In fact, you can only see the gamma burst in this picture when you are observing it along the jet axis. If you look at some other angle, you wouldn't see the camera burst. You may still see any supernova, any hypernova that's associated with this, but you would not see the camera burst. Now, <coughs> these require some special conditions, and there again lots of discussions of what actually produces these rapidly rotating cores. Just from the statistics, we know they must be quite rare. This number means that only about one in a thousand massive stars can produce this. But the other interesting thing is these are energetic explosions, but because all the energy is very collimated, you can actually see this to very large distances. If you're looking along the jet axis, you can see these gamma bursts throughout the whole universe. Unlike supernovae, which you cannot see at very high large distances. And so these gamma ray bursts, even though they're rare, they are actually an excellent probe of the early star formation in the universe. In fact, the most distant object that has been, uh, arguably the most distant object that has been seen so far, is a gamma ray burst that was seen in 2011, which occurred at this redshift of 9.4, which means that when the gamma ray burst was produced, the universe was only 400 million years old compared to the present age of 13.7 million. So this camera burst occurred when the universe was very young. Going back to this picture I showed you earlier, 400 million years is somewhere up here. So this occurred well inside the epoch, well near the end dark ages at least to this picture and in fact may mean that one should probably have one probably has to shift this boundary to earlier times. <coughs> okay, so this sort of is a quick overview of some of the most dramatic types of explosion in the universe. 
just to wrap up, why, what are the implications of supernovae in general? Now, I already showed you that they form an important part of the like life cycle of stars. In fact, the energy input from supernovae is very important in regulating the star formation and the evolution of galaxies in general. Now, I just showed you that supernovae can be used as probes, particular gamma ray bursts can be used as probes to determine the first epoch of star formation in galaxies. And they can be used to measure the expansion of the universe. The supernovae themselves occur under conditions, collapse of a massive star curve produces conditions that are extremely high, that are, you cannot generate on Earth. So the supernova itself probes physics under extreme conditions, fundamental physics under extreme conditions. <clears throat> the same applies to the supernova neutrinos you can see. In 87.8, it was only 17 neutrinos. That didn't tell you all that much. But the next galactic supernova will be observed with modern neutrino detectors, and now you will see thousands of neutrinos. And then you can actually really look at the detailed physics of neutrinos. Now, the last thought I want you want to leave you with is that they're also essential for the origin of life. Now, most of the elements, apart from hydrogen and helium, which are produced in the Big Bang, bang are made either inside of stars or in supernovae. So the supernovae provide a means by which these elements, carbon, oxygen, magnesium, calcium, and iron, are then injected back into the interstellar medium, which then enriches the next generation of star formation with metals, out of which later on planets like the Earth can form and ultimately live. In fact, most of the elements, apart from hydrogen in, in our bodies, must have passed through a star for a supernova. So the last thought I want you to leave with 